Thanks very much. Our last uh, panel uh, presentation is from Richard Marquez. Richard is a third generation native San Franciscan who engages in alliance and social movement building from a Mexican American perspective. He was a member in the formation of the Mission Anti Displacement Coalition and active with urban anti poverty fights in both SRO and public housing in San Francisco. Currently, Richard is a social worker in the downtown east side, working with people living with HIV AIDS who constantly deal with housing and poverty. As a volunteer for the Carnegie Community Action Project and the Downtown East Side Neighborhood Council, Richard was a key organizer with the tenants of the Palace and Wonder Hotels. Richard? I'm going to try one last time. Uh, it has to be turned on. Can you hear me? No. Yeah. Well, Can you hear me? Yeah? Great. Wow, this is great. Uh, the storm's in here, not outside. Uh, I also want to say, I want to send a, a huge shout out to the organizers of this event, the Vancouver Renters Union. Um, long overdue. Thank you so much for inviting me. I've been here for about a year and, wow, I made a big time. I got invited to speak around uh, organizing, anti-poverty organizing. So I'm really appreciative. I also want to, of course, recognize that we're on unsurrendered Coast Salish territory. And I also want to send an acknowledgement out to uh, Ellen Woodsworth, former city councilwoman, too, for being here. And to the downtown east side residents that are in the house, and to Heather Place residents, too. Wow. So yesterday, while Victoria Beckham was at Vancouver's Holt Renfu flagship store marketing her new line of clothing, and uh, Justin Bieber was, um, who grew up in subsidized housing in Ontario, my understanding. Uh, while well, he was tweeting on his technology investments, some of us were organizing against poverty and layoffs and fighting for social housing and preventing rent evictions and struggling to stop refugee deportations and prison lockups. In many parts of the city, it's always the Hunger Games, 24-7. Twitter's new headquarters, by the way, are now in San Francisco. And I, hate, I won't apologize, but I'm probably going to explode a lot of mythologies that you have about San Francisco. Maybe not all of you, but some do. Uh, actually, um, Twitter is right, its new headquarters is on Market Street, and it's right next to the Tenderloin, which has about 250 hotels, SRO hotels. Um, the biggest gentrifier in that neighborhood is the Academy of Art College. And they're buying up whole blocks of apartment buildings and residential hotels. Um, does that sound familiar? I think some of that's happening here too as well. So how do you sum up decades of tenant grassroots organizing? And I think I have some left. I guess you don't do it, so I'll keep rushing through this as fast as I can. Um, I grew up in the political rights movement in the US. And if you know anything about San Francisco, I grew up in a working class neighborhood called Excelsior. Uh, Spike Lee actually, in his film, Sucker Free City, an HBO special, looks at gentrification in San Francisco and what happened in the year in the years in the late 1990s and the years in, in the year 2000, my neighborhood is known for producing um, Jerry Garcia of the Grateful Dead band, and also the killer of Harvey Milk, Dan White, my neighborhood, he's an SF cop. So, the history of organizing in public and public housing and single room occupancy hotels against demolitions, displacement, and gentrification in the 80s, 90s, 2000s. I can't do it in, in a few minutes, but those battles, I think, continue while I'm here as well. Um, there isn't a day, however, that in Vancouver I don't see what's happening there and what's happening here. I kind of have this torturous, irritating dual consciousness. I see what's happening in San Francisco. I see the thing played out here too. Anyway, jump with me really quickly, fast forward this to the 40s and the 50s and the, and the 60s. San Francisco's Council. The Barry Council was formed and it was power elites, corporations that developed uh, financial institutions and uh, they started dividing up the San Francisco regional bay economy. So I think you need to understand that. It's San Francisco is also presently the home of Senator Dianne Feinstein, 
and Nancy Pelosi. It's a strong Democratic Party headquarters. I think it's important for people to understand how to situate the struggle in San Francisco around anti-displacement. It's around also taking on the power elite and the local Democratic Party and the ruling forces on the west coast of the country. Let's also not forget that San Francisco has the dishonorable distinction of having the least amount of African Americans in its city limits, less than 3%. When I was growing up there, it was 11% the population of African Americans. Uh, it's the home of the Beat Generation, the hippies, so forth. It's also the home of the Black Panther Party before Oakland and the Fillmore District. Also, the movement of sanctuary from Central America happened in San Francisco, particularly the Mission District. Uh, that was one of the first waves of gentrification back in the 70s, actually, with the influx of a lot of immigrants from Latin America and from Asia. It also has a history of leftist organizing and crackdowns on union organizing and tenant organizing as well, dating back to the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. If you've ever seen a film called The Rise and Fall of the International Hotel, that takes place in Manila Town, near Chinatown, in the North Beach section of San Francisco. It was a massive movement, great video that I have called The Fall of the International Hotel by Curtis Choi. If you ever want to see that, that was a turning point in San Francisco's tenant organizing history. It brought together Filipinos, white folks, Latinos, African Americans, disabled LGBT people. It was incredible, and that film's a classic in terms of inspiring people. Anyway, I don't know how much more time left, but I'm moving here forward. The Tenants Union of San Francisco, which I was a member of, um, started in the 70s and started getting more and more muscle politically in the 80s and 90s. Uh, it was a collective. It actually was not a nonprofit organization. Um, and it was formed to, to take on the landlord lobby and real estate speculators and developers, of course, and to attack no limits on condo conversions. And at that time, there was no rent control, and there was no such thing as one-for-one -one replacements or affordable housing trusts. So let me jump to the, two, the year 2000 quickly. Um, mayor Willie Brown, he was the first African-American mayor in the city's history. He actually uh, was, in my opinion, one of the most corrupt as well. Uh, he actually handpicked four city council peoples on that seat and they were bought and sold by the real estate lobby. Apparently there was a, a couple of a public city councilors resigned, one was up for re-election in two years. Anyway, the way it was rigged was he pretty much got in a position where he could make direct appointments, so he controlled the, the city council of San Francisco for about eight years. Um, actually, at one point, he actually referred to the city council as having to, having to take care of his hand-picked mistresses, end quote, in the San Francisco Chronicle. Um, so the movement goes on here. Um, he was challenged in 1998 by a first, the first gay supervisor next to Harvey Milk. Harvey Milk never ran for mayor, but Tom Amiano ran for mayor in San Francisco. He's a school teacher. And he ran, he ran against uh, uh, Willie Brown, who was a, uh, a speaker of the House of the California uh, Assembly. So he was really tied into the Democratic Party. And that important run by Tom Amiano in 1998 really galvanized a lot of progressive forces in San Francisco. People that had never worked together, maybe similar to this room at times, people not working together, diverse social forces. Anyway, that whole era introduced a bunch of institutionalized corruption in San Francisco. Um, the director of planning was probed by the FBI. He eventually had to step down. He was caught in, in, in bribery schemes. The head of the Department of, uh, of Public Housing, the same thing happened to him. Uh, Richard Daly from Chicago, the notorious mayor, had come back and forth and was kind of coaching the mayor, actually, we thought, in San Francisco. Um, moving on here, um, in, in 1999, there was a dot-com explosion and boom and bust period. I don't know if people know about that, but that was the beginning of the housing bubble. There were live, work, lofts. There was condo conversions galore. There was mass scale commercial and real estate developments. The Mission District, where I organized and lived for many years, you know, it made national headlines and German television and CBS News. We were taking over dot-com companies. We were taking over housing projects and sitting on the railroad tracks of the cable car turnarounds in the middle of the, the, middle of the height of the tourist season. We believe in direct action and confrontation with the ruling elite of the city. Um, and then, of course, the San Francisco Tenants Union. They initially did not play, sadly, a real pivotal role in organizing a lot of the separate, diverse social forces. They were kind of a day late and a dollar short. 
not as late and a dollar short as the unions. The unions, including the public sector unions, did not get involved in the anti-displacement movement that was happening. You're talking about thousands, anywhere from 10 to 15,000 San Franciscans over a span of about 1995 to about 2002 were being pushed out of the city altogether, completely exiled. And the unions weren't part of it, particularly the industrial unions. Of course, the building trades were not part of it. They were siding with the developers. And the public sector unions that were controlled in part by the Democratic Party, the mayor's office, and the city council, they just stayed on the sidelines and watched the slaughter happen, in my opinion. So we formed the Mission Anti-Displacement Coalition, and we joined forces with artists, the Coalition on the Arts, Jobs, and Housing. The South of Market Coalition also formed the anti-displacement movement. And I don't have much more time left, but I will say that there's challenges, clearly challenges that we continue to face in San Francisco. There, Even though I'm based here, I have a lot of strong relationships that I always, will, of course, maintain. Lessons learned, nothing can be exported here. Everything has to be generally based on the struggles of Vancouver, as you know. But I, I think most of us believe that another Vancouver, of course, is possible. So some lessons quickly. Um, you have to build a citywide labor to tenant union organizing model. Run it on the principles, I believe, of what the VRU stands for. Um, you have to begin to organize the unorganized. You have to talk to SRO tenants, public housing tenants, middle income renters, disabled people, the LGBT community, and please, students. These kinds of conversations, these dialogues, these kinds of forums, you gotta take it to the auditoriums, but you also gotta take it to the streets. And I, I think probably 10 seconds left. Um, you gotta get bilingual and ready to mingle. I'm sorry, you got to. Um, when one out of four households in Vancouver, if not more, speak another language other than English, you gotta get multilingual and you gotta get multiracial in terms of building a social movement for housing justice in Vancouver. Thank